Recording in progress. Hi, welcome to the Village Review Canon workshop meeting of Tuesday, November 22nd, 2022. Please join me in the play. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everyone. So we have a few items here today uh, for discussion. The first is the carryover 10 and a half vacation days for the village administrator. I think we did something similar last year. Okay, so that's what we usually do. Um, then discussion to retain um, Philip Greeley. From Collier's Engineering and Design as a traffic engineer for the AMS housing project. And that's the project, uh, housing project behind the hardware store in Albany Post Road, Marcus. Um, sure, he was supposed to be here. I, I, he probably still on the road. Um, so Phil Greeley has about, I, I really received his resume, he has about 40 years of experience. He's done a whole bunch of major projects in the area. Uh, he has a good relationship with the DOT, he has a PhD in traffic engineering. Um, I know Dave Smith has worked with him. George has worked with him on projects. I've worked with him on uh, other projects in Pete's Skill and I mean um, Dobbs Ferry. So he was going to here to answer any questions. But maybe since Dave is here, he can express a little bit how the process will work, and maybe if he shows up in a couple minutes, he can yeah, introduce can always, up to the board. Yeah, we can and, and that, that way, Dave can explain how that process works. Sure. Oh, by the way, he has a very good relationship with the DLT as well. well that's important. Um, this development for the AMS projects. Uh, they're going to be hiring AKRF to do their traffic side, and then they'll be presenting their their reports to fill for a reviewer, and they'll also be meeting with the DOT, since all the traffic will be going on the Route 9A, so the DOT will be involved in the process as well. So I'll let maybe Dave to express a little more. Sure, thank you, Marcus. Um, so the, so the, as, as part of when you finally get an application that comes in, um, part of the process will be um, through the State Environmental Quality Review Act, the CEDAR uh, laws. And uh, the application will start with this formal submission. Uh, it will be reviewed by staff, it will be reviewed by the uh, board. Um, and one of the first steps in the CEDAR process is to uh, declare your intent to act as lead agency. Um, so essentially that means that there, there is typically one agency or one board that coordinates the environmental review. Um, and typically, it's the board that has the, uh, the approval authority or the funding authority um, as part of a proposed action. So um, it's assumed that the village board would take the lead. There is a, uh, a requirement where you uh, issue the notice of intent to act as a new agency. It would be circulated to a number of uh, interested and involved agencies. Marcus just mentioned New York State DOT, which would be a critical player. It also includes Westchester County, New York State. Um, EDC. Uh, there may be other agencies um, uh, that get involved, but you try and cast as wide a, a net as possible uh, to let these agencies know that um, there's a what the proposed action is and what your intent is in order to coordinate the environmental review. Um, after you've had some uh, feedback, uh, it typically it's you provide 30 days notice for other interested and involved agencies to comment on uh, your intent. After that time period, then it becomes uh, your obligation to declare yourself lead agency and you would coordinate the balance of the environmental review uh, for the proposed action. And I'm assuming that with AMS, they're going to come in with probably some type of zoning text amendment to discuss that, I think, at some point. Um, so there will be a process, there'll be a public hearing process. Um, and as part of that, they'll, they'll need to prepare, at least at, at the very beginning, they'll need to prepare an environmental assessment form. Uh, EAF, and that's a long form. Um, and then they would supplement that with reports, probably for sure. Traffic study, uh, you want to know about utilities, you want to know about uh, potential impacts to uh, your municipal infrastructure, police, fire, uh, schools. Um, you would want to have uh, some type of a fiscal evaluation to understand what the, uh, the implications are from a tax, tax revenue standpoint. So all those get compiled, uh, and at some point you would have a public hearing, um, not only on the, uh, the proposed zoning uh, text amendments, but also on the project itself, um, on the, um, uh, the, the 
conceptual level uh, site plan on all the information of traffic, the, the, the all the other reports, and providing the public and the other involved the, in, interested agencies an opportunity to comment on, on the reports that were prepared. But typically, for this, this type of review, you've had uh, a series of, of, of uh, public comments, and you allow the applicant an opportunity to provide some responses. And in fact, there may be an opportunity based on your comments or comments from the public where there may be changes made to the site plan or changes made to the zoning. Uh, so it's an opportunity for the public to participate uh, as part of the process, as part of the, the transparency in, in, the, uh, in the environmental review. And once the applicant has had an opportunity to provide some responses, um, your board at some point in the, uh, in the near future uh, would need to make a determination of significance. And under Seeker, um, a determination of significance means that if, it, if you find that um, the impacts to the project uh, are negligible, or if there are impacts, they've been mitigated to the maximum extent practicable. <clears throat> You could uh, issue a what's called a negative declaration, which means that the environmental review includes. Uh, if you find that uh, there are significant adverse impacts as a result of all the studies and uh, the implications of the proposed project, then you could issue a, what's called a positive declaration, and that means that the um, the project has to go through a much more intensive environmental review. <clears throat> For instance, if there, and I'm just hypothetically. If there was so much traffic on going out onto design that it, it, it um, caused problems with the intersections up and down the, uh, the roadway, that could be a it could be considered a significant adverse impact and maybe a trigger for requiring a uh, an environmental impact statement. But again, that that's part of the process that, that you would go through. That's that's really a, an important component getting to the determination of significance. Um, but that you will have significant information in the background before you get to that point in the process. And uh, once you've concluded the environmental review, then you're essentially you're, you're in a position where if you want to uh, vote on the proposed zoning text changes, you can do that. Uh, and then the rest of the process will play itself out. There would need to be a uh, site plan submission made at some point. Uh, to the village for planning board review, um, and that will, and then that's a process in and of itself where there would be additional public hearings uh, allowing the public to comment on, on the specifics of the plan. So that provides a, a pretty uh, comprehensive overview of the environmental review process. Um, and you know, just I don't know, if Bill hasn't gotten here yet, no. but uh, just I'll, I'll echo. <laughs> Some of Marcus's comments I, I've known Bill uh, for a number of years, uh, almost my entire professional career. Um, and he's a uh, you know, straight shooter. I and mean, I've worked on both sides. I worked with him and I've worked uh, with him reviewing the projects that I've been on. Uh, so I think he would be a, an excellent good Excuse me, two processes here. Okay. First, there has to be a zoning text amendment prior to a formal application to the planning board. The planning board would then review the site plan based on what is allowed by the zoning and then the procedure process for the site plan is done. I'm not so sure. I think we're confusing the two issues, all right? I don't understand what the scope is of this, of this uh, contract. Is this only to allow for a text amendment to allow the project to move forward? Or is this for the entire review process for the proposed site plan? Because we don't have, obviously we don't have an application. There's still a for sale site on a property. So I'm a little confused about where we're going and what this is actually for. And customarily, when somebody goes for a site plan, part of the site plan is that the applicant will provide the traffic study and then the traffic study would be reviewed by our consultant. Are we just retaining him to review these or are we retaining him to create a seeker for our zoning text amendment? Because we need that process completed before the other process can move forward. So, yes, uh, I'll just clarify so that 
uh, as part of the, the zoning text amendment, um, the applicant would be submitting uh, concept level plans, or they may be more detailed than just the concept, so that uh, the village understands uh, more clearly what the impacts are of the proposed project. <clears throat> you just don't want to have the, the zoning text without some underlying information that helps relate and understand what the impacts are. Uh, with the understanding that once the zoning text is correct, once the zoning text amend amendments are in place, then there's a more formal process that goes before the planning board. But as part of the, the environmental review for the zoning, you will not understand what the implications are of that zoning as it's implemented. Because that zoning is a that zoning is for that entire zone. That's so correct. it has to take into consideration the entire zone. That's correct. And who's paying for this? Are we going to be paying for this or is the applicant paying for this? The applicant is paying 100 percent of it. They're willing to start the ball rolling now. They want to start discussion with DOT. Uh, and it doesn't cost the taxpayers anything. Um, they well, want to because we're the middleman, we're the administrator now. Yes. So we're not charging them our administrative fee. And who's to say that they're going to agree with our expert review? So you know what I mean? The so, bill's here. So Phil, this is the village board. Uh, so no, but, yeah. but the applicant will also, once they submit an application, I think we're ahead of the curve at this point. They they can't submit an application right. until the right. zoning is done. Right. You can't, you right. can't so this discussion is not to actually retain the services, it's only to discuss who the village would no, 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 no. What, no, we're, no, try, what we're trying to do is what uh, the applicant has asked for us to start moving forward. They have they hire AKRF. They're already trying to do some traffic calculations. They want to start meeting with the village traffic engineer, which does with the, our administrative fee, which would pay it was Phil send us a bill. We get we pay it out of escrow, we pay the escrow. And we do on any account that we do. So they want to start having discussion with Phil and discussion with DOT, assuming that the board is going to and take that risk and assuming the village board is going to accept the zoning tax amendment. If you don't, they're still going to pay out of escrow. They just want to start the process flowing. That's what you know, we've already had traffic studies on this road. All of them say to a, di a different entry and a different egress that it's going to increase traffic during this peak time and that peak time. We went through this with the with the projects across the street from from the hardware store. We had multiple uh, uh, reviews for that. that yeah, course. but the DOT, uh, uh, Phil Greeley, and uh, we talked a little bit about you. Talk about uh, good evening, Phil Greeley, Collier's engineering and design. Uh, our focus would be interacting with the village and DOT. Um, just a little background about myself and the company. Uh, we represent municipalities, but we also represent private developers. So we, we know both sides of, of how things get developed. Uh, we do uh, projects in the Hudson Valley. I represent the town of East Chester, the town of Cornwall Planning Board, the village of Woodbury Planning Board, only specific to craft. Uh, reviewing applications, making recommendations, uh, on a project like this, one of the most important steps is interacting with DOT so that the DOT knows what the village wants and it knows early on in the game. Um, so in terms of, you know, reviewing the applications, there's technical, you know, criteria we have to follow. Um, but in the past, and, you know, when we're reviewing the application for a municipality, we look at what improvements would be needed. You know, the, the first step really is to set up the scope to make sure that they're addressing everything that's of concern to the village. Um, the standards that are followed are the requirements of DOT in terms of how you do traffic counts, how you analyze intersections, how you look at accidents, how you look at safety. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, the, the process starts with the initial kind of scoping and depending on the process that the village goes through, whether it's a long form EAF or EIS, you know, will kind of determine the path that we, you know, go through in the process. But to me, the most important first step is having a meeting with DOT to get their input to know what parameters that they will be looking for and have the village perspective as opposed to just the applicant's perspective in front of you. So.
So you're not only going to review the traffic, so you're going to perform the traffic. So typically what we do is we check what the applicant does. Um, in a case like this on the seeker, you know, the, the payments are for to review what is being done, to make sure that it's done adequately, technically sound, and then as a representative of the village, interacting with DOT, to make sure that when DOT reviews it, that our positions are being looked at as part of their review, because they're the permitting agency for any driveways, any intersection improvements, or anything else. So you're not going to be writing a seeker for the zoning text amendment. You're just, no, no. Okay, that's going to be the applicant. And yes. In that in that seeker is going to be the traffic study as well as other things for the entire zone, Correct. not just for this one project. Correct. And let me reiterate: the village isn't paying for. It. We're going to be the administrator, which right. you know I don't know why we would do that. They should be direct bill. Yeah, that's. We'll we'll charge that. And we don't normally charge it. No. We don't sell it anything extra. We charge it 10%. No. No. Yeah, that's what other people say. Not our code. It's not anything. Yeah. We can, you can change the code to do that. <laughs> I, I don't see anybody, I don't think anybody else has done that that I know of. No. So is this this entire seeker is going to be for the entire C1, two, a C2 district or just the overlay district? It's just the overlay. So we're going to have the zoning text amendment to an overlay. That's what the top of the application will be, which is going to be front of the board to consider. So we're going to have three different zoning codes for one piece of property. Doesn't that sound a little strange? All right. No. 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 <laughs> Any questions for Phil at all? Phil, thanks for thanks for thanks for coming. Oh, hey, what yeah, another question for him. when you're doing this? What what are you going to use for their uh, for their site plan? Because the one we have here doesn't exactly say how many units they're asking for. They're saying they're asking for two hundred residential parking spaces with a ratio of one point three to blank. So. Where, where are you going to get your information? Or how is the process going to take place? Are you going to interact directly with the applicant and then provide us with the information? Or Well, typically it's up to the board. Uh, in some municipalities, they don't want the consultants interacting directly without a representative of the village. Staff. In other municipalities, they let you know the discussions go on between the two consultants uh, in this particular case, I think the plan I saw had 148 units. I, I don't know what that's 148 and one commercial unit, 10,000 square feet. So the parameters that would be done, and in this case, because it, it involves not just the study of a, of a specific plan, but the, the zoning, uh, would have the range of what would be allowed. So they may propose 148, but under the zoning, and I, I don't know the details of that, may allow more units. So we would make sure we analyze the maximum and also in terms of the effect, you know, within the district itself. Well, currently um, the zoning allows for, with a special permit in the overlay, I believe 12 units per acre. Yeah. When, as long as 50% of the square footage is commercial. So I believe that's the way the overlay zoning reads right now by special permit. I think as of right as eight units. I, I could be totally wrong it just off the top of my head. Yeah, typically what we would do is interact with the planner and the engineer to go through and make sure that the what the applicant is analyzing is an accurate picture on what can be done both feasibly and within the zoning. Wow. Um, so I, I think, you know, one of the things that we would do is advise the board on like the mix. We would ask for different combinations of, of residential and commercial possible to see what the effect would be on traffic generation. But, you know, typically what we do is review the study, 
and the applicant, AKRS, is their consultant, you know, knows how to prepare studies according to DOT criteria. Uh, we would review it to make sure of the accuracy of all the projections of the base conditions and all the information and review what they're proposing in terms of access scenarios, uh, mitigation measures, um, you know, do they have adequate site distances, everything you know that relates to traffic and traffic flow. That's what we would review and advise them to work on. Okay. So are they going to come to us first and then we set the parameters? Or are they going to come up with their maximum required usage for the seeker and then we can pare it down? Is there uh, sure. well under under seeker you want to look at the the, uh, the largest impact possible? Yeah, that's what I mean. The maximum right. use, yeah. Right. Yes. So if you're you're Evaluating the biggest envelope possible, and then anything, any changes to the project would be within inside that envelope and maybe smaller. So the seeker would not include the financial advantages or disadvantages or impact the school system, it's just the environmental review. No, no, no seeker that they keep to account. Yeah. If, if, the, if the village board wants to have that evaluated, you can request to have that as part of the analysis. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I think I mentioned that as part of yeah. my opening remarks that that may be one of the things you want to evaluate is from a fiscal standpoint, what are the, the changes from a tax standpoint, what are the potential impacts from service providers, school district, and if that could be part of the environment. Well, that, that is also as per our code part of the granting of a special use permit, all those things are taken into account with special permit. But if the board approves as of right, then that is removed. So Special permitting allows you to take into ancillary issues. As of right, you can't make a, a reason why not to allow it as of right. So this is where I'm a little concerned about how we make these zoning text amendments based on a seeker that might not include ancillary issues that would be included in a special use permit. If we make this an as of right zone, we can't use those factors. No, I think the term as of right is. Um, not exactly correct because it's really and your village attorney could uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but there really is no such thing as as of right. Um, an action has to be evaluated under seeker regardless of the zoning parameters and it has to be evaluated with the potential impacts. Um, well, our as of right usage in our code takes uh, into account that all of these things should have been factored into the zoning chain. So it, it takes for granted that somebody has reviewed this and made it as of right. If you're saying a maximum seeker usage can be pared down, you know, that's that's just the issue I'm going to have with it. Any other questions? Thank you, Phil. What is, what other thing that you would want to think about in terms of you know, other issues, but with traffic, what is the extent of what you want to study in terms of the number of intersections, the areas that you want them to focus on? And, you know, we can help guide you, but, you know, you typically what happens is the village would make sure that all the intersections that you want evaluated are part of the traffic study that they prepare so that the village is not spending money um you know you get the applicant to, to evaluate those <laughs> and then once they submit it we can review it on the behalf yeah, so that's so who's going to set the parameters for this typically we can give advice to the board depending on how you go in the seeker process if you go and you dave i don't i don't know the history here but if you went into a pause deck you did an eis it would be a scoping session uh, there can also be a scoping session, even with a warm form EAF, uh, which I think may be the, the direction you're going. And, um, you know, you would come up with a list of intersections. You would, you know, have input on that. Uh, but, you know, there could be other ones added. Uh, and then once you go to a public hearing, people may ask questions about other locations, and then you get the applicant to evaluate. 
That's the typical process that goes on. I think we're going to have to do an EAF anyway because it's a type one action. Yes. Yes. Uh, so, any input that you know the board may have on make sure, Phil, that you have them study this, or you know, we we set it in scope. And we typically would put together like a draft scope, or have the applicant put it together. We would review it. Add to it and then review it with the board, make sure that covers everything we do want to evaluate. Which is you know, your, your charge. All right. And there again, this is just for the zoning check at this point. Yes. 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 Okay. It's just for the zoning change, but just but to be clear, as part of the zoning change submission, the applicant will include plans to sure. help the, the village sure. better understand the implications of, of well, actually implementing. Uh, the zone change. The, the, the village board is not going to be the granting, the issuing authority of or approval of the site plan. Correct. That's the planning board. Yeah, right. Because mm -hmm. you know, in New York, the the village board can supersede the planning board. Yes. Uh, Thanks, Phil. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, um going to be scheduling a public hearing overriding the New York State property tax. This is something we have done for several years. So we'll have that on the agenda for the mm -hmm. December. Mm -hmm. And okay. the next is a discussion on January. well, the call for the public hearing December right. for January, yeah. correct. Okay. And discussion on water rates. So there has been some questions about the increase in the water rates. Um, our administrator, Marcus Serrano, will uh, go over that with us now. Uh, sure. I know um, uh, some residents have, have, um, have concerns about what the water rate increases have been, uh, especially the last fiscal year. Um, so I've kept some for the benefit of the public and the board members might know a lot of this stuff, but for the benefit of the public and I'll be watching and watching in the near future, just got a little statement to make. And then I got a little PowerPoint presentation, um, just to, um, <laughs> at least to set some groundwork in regard to how we got where we are. Um, so the village has certain requirements on the state law. We follow generally, generally accept the accounting principles. We're going to create the budget and everything else in the, in the, in the private sector, there's a FASB board, we have a GASB board, and they said uh, an announcement in regards to how we do budgeting, how to do accounting, and everything else. So, under New York State law, I'm a budget officer. Uh, I'm fiduciary responsible to handle all the finances for the village and make sure we provide a balanced budget. Uh, I am required under the law to provide a tentative budget to the, to the board in March. The board has March, eight, end of March, beginning of April, and I have to adopt the budget by May. So I take this very seriously to provide a balanced budget, but also provide a budget that actually is financially stable and actually puts the village in a good financial condition. During that process, I have to look at all the revenues, all the expenses. There are expenses that are mandatory. There are expenses that, that are a little bit of a little bit of flexibility. Work with the department heads to do provide a budget to the board that actually has a balanced budget, a little bit of a positive cash flow to make sure we're in a positive arena. The difference here, we're talking about taxes is more stable. You know what your taxes are going to be. When we do our tax bill based on the assessment, done, no big deal. Water, as people know, it fluctuates. It fluctuates with the temperature, it fluctuates with how you use your water, who, what, access, what you use, how many children you have, how many people you have in your house. So that's a little tougher to actually try to balance out the budget. Um, so doing that process um, in my 40 years of experience, I've had municipalities that had water and sewer, and I try to try to balance out that as much as I can. The difference here is, as everybody knows, with the closure of Indian Point, you had a, a substantial large customer that had water flows that were not actually related to the actual flow of water that was actually being produced, being used by that that by by that municipal by that um, client, which were in the point yeah. at that time, there was a problem with two meters, um, really three meters, uh, and they're being kept on reporting those meters were not working efficiently. So what happened was that um, the village, for many years, has been overestimating or estimating the bills higher and higher and higher to try to draw their attention. 
talked to George about this as well. George said, I remember 10, 15 years ago telling them to fix the meter. And during that time, there was a decision to keep on overestimating the bill to try to get their attention. So now with the closure in the point, um, last year, one of the meters was fixed. And then more recently, the second meter was fixed. And, and now, we, now we have actual readings that are going on. So during that process, and I'm going to show you a PowerPoint presentation, show you a bit of what the impact's going to be. The village, the village users were benefiting by the amount of excess bills that were access rates that we're charging in the point and whole tech versus what they would have normally have paid. So that's the main reason for the water bill increase over the last year, because now all the meters are fixed. Bad news, I didn't want to increase anybody's taxes, I don't want to increase anybody's water, but the problem we have to have a balanced budget. And I was still trying to keep a little of a fund balance to show the village is financially stable and financially responsible to the taxpayers and the water users. So what happened was when the last bill went out, there was the last meter, the last meter was fixed. And then I see the flow going down substantially, but the usage that we're actually paying to, to, to um, we buy our water from Peekskill or from Montrose, they, their effect wasn't that, that large. So therefore the expenses were still a little, the expenses for purchase the water was still about the same level, but at the same time, the water revenue went down. So I had to make up the difference. The difference was about a million dollars that we had to make up between what we were collecting versus what we should have collected. So what I'm gonna do now, show you a little PowerPoint presentation, just to give the public a little visual of what it looks like. So just give me a second, I'm just gonna share my screen here. So, and then not only the meters, Marcus, we went from a fully operational nuclear power plant with approximately a thousand people. And then it went down to, I think there's about 300 now. Correct. So, what I'm going to do here is hopefully you can see that. Yes. So just for the public and for the board, we we, we have this discussion during the budget season. Let's just show you the operation of the uh, waterfront. The majority of the waterfront is due purchase of water from Montrose and Peekskill. And then we have the personal expenses, the benefits, a little bit of equipment and the transfers. We can discuss the transfers a little bit too, but the transfers is tied in. Because one of the things I've noticed when I started here, which, which was, there was a lot of money being transferred from the general fund to the, to the, I mean, from the water fund to the general fund to offset the taxes in the general fund. Normally, in my experience, water and water fund and the general fund should be totally separate from each other, should be independent of each other. And that came up with a good question during my interview with Moody's when we had a Moody uh, bond rating. They were saying, why are you doing this? And I said, well, I don't know why that was being done in the past. And maybe somebody can enlighten me on that one. But they said, that's not... We do not want to see that because then you're somewhat reducing the taxes lower than they should be because you're transferring money from the water. So they they recommended that we end that kind of uh, activity. So I told them, well, I'll be working on that in order to create a fund balance between the water and the general fund so that we need to be totally independent and self-sufficient of each other. So that's part of the process. Now she, uh, you'll see that in one of the other spreadsheets. So this here shows you what the operating expenses is in the water fund. So you can see what that is. This chart shows you the fund balance of the water fund going back to 18 and 19. So this is interesting because back in 18 and 19, there was a substantial fund balance close to a million dollars. And then every year after that, 8 and 9, 8 and 9, sir, so correction, thanks, sir. Yeah, 8 and 9, we go back to 8 and 9, we'll put $1 million. You see every year, um, it was probably done on purpose, was to keep the rates down. They used the fund balance to keep the rates down, but that created a deficit in each, in each year. So each year you had a deficit, as you can see, all the way to 2012, 13, which you actually had a negative fund balance. That means there was no cash in that time. And again, talking to Cindy, who was here, during that time, she had to actually transfer money from the general fund to the water fund to cover expenses, because we bill every six months, and we do get monthly billing, but there are expenses that have to pay every single day, so therefore money had to be transferred back and forth to make sure there's enough cash flow to make sure the water fund is operational. That was a concern to me as well, because I worked for another municipality that didn't have fund balance and didn't have enough cash to pay its bills. And they came to a point where they had to borrow money to pay their operations. 
In this instance, at least you had the general fund able to cover the water fund. And during those years, if you look at when they did my budget presentation regarding the general fund, the general fund was very tight on cash as well. So the village was at one point very close to having to borrow money to pay for operations. Thank God those days are over now. And my ultimate goal is to, like I said, is to have both funds independent of each other and have a fund balance. So, so Mark, can I have one yeah. second on it? So you're saying in 2012 and 2013, we had a negative number, but we were still able to transfer over half a million dollars. Correct. I'll get into that. Thing. So we did have a fund balance. It was just expended. It, exactly. It, well, there was no fund balance because you, the, the well, money was, it, it was transferred. So well, I thought it was there. It was there, but the financial <laughs> statements show you have a negative fund balance. That's and because you took it to well, we could, right. You we took one, you, you, you robbed Peter to pay Paul. That's right. what happened. Yeah, but Paul was supposed to be repaid out of the bonds. Oh. 625,000. Okay. All I'm going is, I wasn't here, I'm going about the financial okay. statements. Okay. That's all I can go by financial statements during that time. So, so it was interesting. In those years, we, we at 2008 and nine, going to nine and 10, there was a, a deficit, an actual deficit of $411,000, then $200,000. Then there was a another $300,000 deficit. It's like, it, I don't like personally, it's a board decision, but I don't like roller coasters rides when it comes to some of these, especially the government funds. It should be a balanced level budget. That way also gives you a, a position where you have enough cash to pay for emergencies, to cover any, any expenses that come out, to make sure you have enough cash to pay for your bills. It's like there should be no roller coaster ride the way I see it here. Uh, I also saw the water rates going up, going up, going down, negative. It's like it, it, I, it's financially, I don't like the way this process works. And that's why I'm trying to get you guys in the, in the fiscal financial position that's balanced and equitable. That way, if you're looked upon by the state controller's office or Moody's or standing to the poor, financially, you're in a stable, stable environment. What this chart also saw, the lines going across, just to let you know, they are, it's like orange and purple. The, and Moody says you should be about 10 to 15% fund balance. We could be as low as 10, as high as 15. So as you can see, now the 20 to 21 year, you're above the 10%. So what's good news is that financially, you're going in the right direction. And then what helps also is then the water rates will actually start levering off and then only have to cover the smaller increase on an annual basis. But the, with Entergy now going and Holtec done, it, you're done with it. It's like, same thing when we lost a pilot, okay? Thank God with cessation fund, also had, a big, had to make a big increase. Here, you had no cessation fund to make up the difference, but it was made up during this last round of the increase that we had to do, and that's gone from this point forward. So that, I, don't, I don't see any large increases in the water rates in the foreseeable future, Unless God forbid something happens with Montos or Pete's going to want to charge us a lot, but we're in a position where now we, we are financially sound, that we actually have a fund balance, that we actually can now control can control the future in regards to how the water rate increase is going to be. So let me go to the last last one here. If you compare the two charts, like like Trustee Mary said, every year, even though your fund balance was going down in water fund, the money was being transferred to the general fund. And again, it was being used to keep taxes down. But if you look at it, then the water people, people paying the water were paying higher to subsidize the, the general fund in order to do that. Whatever, if that was the decision was made, that's fine. But you can see in 19 and 20 and 20, 2021, the transfer was actually reduced substantially. And what's good about that is now we have two or three years of not doing transfers, which is still in the budget, which means next year, I do not have to, we do not have to transfer three or four or $500,000 or budget that money so we can use that to offset the water rate increases. But keep in mind, there's no contingency account in the water fund. So you do wanna have a contingency, some contingency case of emergencies. But again, this could be a further discussion with next year's budget to talk about what do the board wants to see as a fund balance? What kind of contingency you wanna see? But at the end of the day is the substantial increases in the water is not gonna be seen again, hopefully for next, for the foreseeable future, because now we have a control of what's going on. So that's that's my explanation of what went on. We had a lot of unknowns, uh, but now we have two water readings. Holte Entergy fixed one meter, then Holte fixed the other meter. Both of them are remote now, so we can actually see the usage. 
We know when they're working. Um, we have more active what's going on. Um, so we have that control. And another thing the village board can do is, you know, we have a rate structure that's been produced. If the board wants to do this in the future, I've seen in other, in other water funds is the higher users may, uh, right now it's a sliding scale that goes up. You can increase that for the industrial users and maybe charge them more. And that way you keep the residence rate down. So that's an option we could discuss during the budget cycle as well. We were kind of told that that's illegal. You have one water rate for a water somebody who purchases it. If we buy it and we sell it. We can't say if you're a commercial, you're going to pay more. Montrose does it. Montrose, yeah, yeah Montrose uh, has an industrial use and everybody else. So you could have the authority to do an industrial use rate and then, if, and then for everybody else. That, had, that, that would have to be something with the surcharge because you have an increased surcharge because of an industrial user. Correct. So there has to be some kind of factor. You just can't arbitrarily say, I'm going to charge you 56 cents a cubic foot. I'm charging you 75 cents a cubic foot because you use more. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And how much has our surcharge gone down from because we're not selling as much water? Oh, it's I actually went down to like well, I think the last search I was like twenty or thirty thousand dollars. Thirty thousand a month or, or that was for one one month. One month. Thirty thousand a month. Yeah. Yeah. So so what what so, was it before? Because I remember oh my like God, 60, like, 70, Yeah, you got it. Yeah, like it's like went down almost to less than half what's going down. Mm -hmm. So the so now we see with the all the meters working properly. Now we see the uses coming coming down as well. And now that means we're going to buy yes, less water. The surcharge goes down, the expenses go down, which means the rates will balance out. And now I can also, also use that transfer to the general fund to help offset any increases in the future as well. And I'm saying we'll know a lot more for this year's budget coming up because now I'm going to I'm going to have at least I'm going to have at least nine to ten months of actual usage that we never had before. So are we going to start doing the major repairs out of the water fund because the water fund has money in it. And we're not transferring it to the general. So when we have a water main break, we got to pay a hundred thousand dollars to repair. It. Is it going to come out of this water fund or out of the general fund? That's what continue. Nobody will continuously be before. That's why I'm going to talk to the board. Maybe mm -hmm. instead yeah. of transferring, instead of transferring three or four or five hundred thousand dollars as we used to do, maybe we'll keep a contingency of two hundred thousand. Well, what are we going to use the fund balance for then? The fund balance, the fund balance, the one-time expenses. So we can transfer that to a capital fund for one time. And keep the fund balance between 10 or 15 percent. If whatever the board wants to go, if you want to do 12 percent fund balance, that 10 percent fund balance, and then anything above that can be used for one time capital expenses to keep the tax to keep the rates down for the future as well. So that's an option we could discuss during the budget cycle. And what's the uh, the current fund balance? The, uh, the current fund balance is one, I'll tell you right now. Hold on a second. Right in the current fund balance, five hundred thousand. Now, the year that we haven't closed yet, which is um, the twenty one twenty two year, it's interesting. Uh, the orders just fi uh, finished their um, site work. They have a tentative fund balance increase. We might have a fifty thousand dollar fund ba fund balance increase. So our budget was very close to break it even, winning that year. So that was my concern as well. Is that I didn't want to have another deficit coming to the new year that we're in right now. So last year's fund balance increase might be 50,000. So we're very close to breaking even. So now that's 500,000, we're 500,000, that's 12.66% where we'll be at right now. And with 100,000, it will be probably at, you know, 13%. And like we said, then at that point, we can keep that fund balance the way it is, reduce it to 12, put some money for contingency or capital projects if you want to do that. And of course, you can't use that to really offset taxes. I mean, the water rate, well, you do that, then what happens next year? You're not going to have that money for next year. So it's, normally, I, we discussed a little bit about fund balance policy. So I want to bring that up through the budget cycle as well. That way you say, this is what fund balance should be. Anything above that should go to capital projects. And the board decides what are the priorities for the use of that capital project money. It's almost like the reserve we do with the fire department. We give them fifty thousand dollars every year, and then the board decides how that money is going to be used. We finally do the same thing with the water fund. So that's a game plan. Do you have the same analysis for the actual cost of usage going back to these dates, or at least back 
couple of years? I know I've asked for some other details. Um, well, a sense of what it actually costs the village and not. Well, I, I can give that to you, but if you look at the, like I said, you go into the fund balance, total revenue expenses, that's where you wind up at. So if you went back to 18 and 19, um, 18 and 19, we had a zero fund balance, 18 and 19, but you transferred $700,000 at that point, close to $700,000. So there was, that, that, that seven, it was, they actually budgeted 750,000. That was actually supposed to be transferred, 700,000 was transferred. So that money did come in from, re, from revenue to do that. Now, like I said, I'm ending that practice at the same time. So we, you're gonna have a balanced budget between revenue and expenses finally, which we never had before. And the rate of water has gone up? Yes. So, I mean, you discussed that last time we asked you about this, about a surcharge, the escalated surcharge, and the rate going up. Correct, correct. So this all is in play with the- That was all in play with, uh, the biggest hit was the Indian Point Holtec um, excess that we were charging. They were not using the water. We were just overestimating them. And they, they paid it. They didn't complain. We set them a bill. They doubled it, whatever, they, before my time, they doubled the bill, they tripled the bill, and they just paid it. But the actual water consumed would have been less. Correct, correct. So that's that's where they took that extra money and transferred to the general fund. That those days are no longer here. And that, for example, the- But we're using less water now. We're using less water now, but we don't know what the delta was between what was actually being used and what was not being used during all those years. But now we do know. And that was and that was balanced out between what we buy and what we use. So if, give me a perfect example. One of the entities bills, one of the one of them, the last bill for the month was twenty one thousand dollars. Okay, that same bill two years ago was one hundred and fifty six thousand dollars. Okay, well, what was what was the cost to the village? I. Uh, Oh, I, I can give you what we actually pay Montrose and Verplank. Yeah. That, that's in the financial. I mean, that's all in the financial well, statements. The excess that's all in money there. is, is yeah. the excess is money with the less use of water. Correct. And that and money was used to transfer the money to the general fund. So now it looks like we're just not doing that. Now we're not transferring, but we're still keeping the cushion. And now we don't have energy, energy to pay for that cushion, but the residents instead. The only, so no, you have no cushion, because that's what I'm trying to say, because because right now he was basically subsidizing right and you were subsidizing but there was th that that cushion regard they were paying so was because was that cushion was made up by the excess bill that we were charging and that cushion is gone so like i said that yeah you said that there's five hundred thousand in the fund correct and even with that five hundred thousand dollars when you look at 18 like 18 or 19 we made two hundred thousand dollars there was we didn't transfer any money. We didn't transfer any money to the general fund. Right. Okay, our fund balance went up by two hundred. So three hundred thousand was used to pay expenses. Do you understand? Do you understand that part? Because that five hundred thousand dollars that was budgeted to be transferred to the general fund, it wasn't done, and I didn't do it on purpose because of the expenses in the water fund was higher, actual. So I had to use. 300,000 to pay the expenses. So the fund balance went up by 200,000. And like I said, you have the, finan the financial statements have all that information on it. You can see the actual revenue to expenses. Those are the actual numbers, folks. So if people are concerned that we're being overbilled, just look at the fund balance. Because if you're overbilled, the fund balance would be a million dollars. It's not. The, that money is being used to pay expenses. But the fund balance is 500,000. Correct. Correct. So, so those two years was a guess because we, we didn't know how much of a cushion, how much extra we were charging all Holtec and Montreal. I mean, Holtec and Entergy. Now we have the actual numbers. So next year's budget now, when we do next year's budget, I'll have actual revenues estimated from both com from both companies plus everybody else. And now I can see what the actual expenses would be. So the, there might be no water rate increase next year. Or maybe one percent, depending on what that happened with the water rates between Montreal and and Indian scale. This will be more on one on one comparison. But the rate than, per cubic foot for the average village resident almost double that of an outside, you know, somebody paying the New York, um, the town of Portland or Montrose. Give you an example. Montrose has eight hundred fifty customers. 
we have 750. Their budget is 1.8 million. Our budget is almost two, three million. Um, Yorktown have 10,000 customers. Cortland has 8,000 customers. We have 750. So it's also economies of scale that you have to consider as well. You have more customers, a lower budget, so therefore the spread out is less. But the only driver to the budget is the cost of the water. And I mean, the expenses are Correct. minimal. Mm -hmm. So it's 84% 84, 84 of that is made up of the water mm -hmm. itself. Correct. That's a pass through. Correct. That's correct. And and so our water rate should really be equal to anybody else who's paying, who's buying water from the Montrose business, uh, Montrose Improvement District or the other uh, plus, you know, plus the 200000 or whatever it is for the extra expenses. Okay. It so it shouldn't that, be substantially higher. Oh, oh, I can go by. It's actually what we pay Pete Skill with Montrose. If we have to pay them two and a half, two point eight million. Then add a couple hundred thousand dollars. You owe me that three of three million. Montrose is one point eight million. That's half the budget. Is there a big difference between what we pay on the rate between what we pull from P Skill and what we pull from Montrose? P Skill's rate is P Skill's rate is a little lower, and then Montrose charges the surcharge as well. So there's a higher rate that we pay, higher than Montrose would pay, but we also pay the surcharge on top of that when it comes up. So the rates are not a comparison. We're not paying the same rate the Montrose residents are paying. And we're not paying the same rate the Peace Corps residents are paying. But they do charge a higher rate for industrial users. Oh, but all I can say is, you know, if- Who charges the higher rate for industrial users? No, they both charge a higher rate than their own residents for industrial users. Yes, they do. But we get hit. We get hit with a, with a surcharge where we go higher amount. So that's why we try to buy get more water from Peekskill. They try to do a 60 40, 40 split between the two. They try to get the surcharge down on the Montrose side. And all, all I can say is the numbers don't lie. Yes, I'll, but I'll fund us at 500000 Again, it's a guess because I don't know what the actual rates are going to be for, for them for whole take and Montrose. I mean, whole take and energy. Now that we do know, then we actually would have an idea. And at the same time, the water should go down because they are shutting down. So, you know, their bills are going down substantially. So we got hit with double whammy. First of all, we're being possibly overbilled. And at the same time, this happened when they're, when they're, when they're shutting down and the water usage is going down. So it, it's, a, it, it's the best guess estimate that I can do. And it's like I said, if we went back and you said, you know, our fund balance is seven, eight hundred thousand dollars, so you say, okay, there's not there's a, a, an issue going on. For the last two years, we had a fund balance of two hundred thousand. Two hundred two hundred thirty one year, two hundred one year we had two hundred and seventeen fund balance. And last year we had two hundred and eighty, but this year we're gonna have fifty. So there was a balance, there was a balanced budget at actual. In this year's budget that we just finished, and the difference only fifty thousand dollars. So if there was overcharge, if there was overcharge, you would see a higher fund balance. So that fund balance is used for water main breaks and anything to do with the infrastructure of our water delivery system. Correct. Oh, you know, you, know, you so can. So we start... have to have something, something in there. Correct, and that the board decision. I'll try to get this chart show you where Moody wants you to be at. You can be at lowest ten percent if you wanted to, because if the general, general, if the general fund is strong and the water fund is balanced finally and financially stable, that's what you want to do. But worst case scenario, you had an emergency in the water fund, you can have borrowed money from the general fund, but you have to pay it back. But you have you have a place to borrow money from finally. You didn't have that before. And I wonder what happened to the Montrose district because they had to be making good money with Entergy Open also because they were doing a lot of surcharges. Well, the because search out, of, it was coming to us. Yeah, yeah. we were paying. Well, well, that means yeah. that our, our rate went up. Mm -hmm. The general user rate went up. Correct. That's correct. That's correct. So there's a couple of things we could do. Like I said, we can re, we're going to reduce the amount being transferred to the general fund, totally eliminate it, but they have no contingency. They put a way contingency in there. Um, you, can, you can use fund balance one time, but then you don't have that flexibility next year. Uh, you can move that money capital projects. For next year and keep it a lower fund balance. There's a whole bunch of options you can do, but I do, like I said, I see a very minimal 
if any increase of water rates for next year. It just depends if Montrose or Creek Correct. Series are Correct. Correct. Now we uh, we actually now we actually have a plateau now that we can work off of, which we never had before. And this is just another another piece of the puzzle of losing your largest uh, taxpayer. Or a, ta or, or a water user that didn't care how much they, they yes, because, much because because I talked to George about that. George said we kept on talking to hope uh, interview yes. about that, and he said by the time we go through the process to get it fixed. It's too much of a problem. I rather we rather pay the water bill. It was surprising, but they did it. Okay. And that that just goes to show going forward with the development in the village, not to put all your eggs in one basket. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Um, Hopefully that's helpful. With the water rate. Okay. All right, so we stop sharing. We we'll go back. So when would we? When oh, would well, you we have a hand raised. I, right. one, one other question. When would we explore the mm -hmm. possibility of charging an industrial rate? We can start doing that in New Year. That's we can, that. Yeah. What's, it, that, what's that industrial rate going to be based on? I would check with the state to see if there's any regulations in regards to what you can do. Oh, oh, well, I'm sure I, there has to be something. You I'll, just can't, I'll double yeah, check because yeah. I know two municipalities that do it. I don't know how they did it and why they did it. Um, I could, I could, I do some research on that. Yeah. Great scale. Yeah. Sure. Yep. So I can, I know, I know a couple of us that have an industrial rate. Um, and I would see if there's any regulation in regards to any, any legality. I do agree with you. I don't do anything we could be challenged for. Mm -hmm. So, and then we can figure that out. You're going to be challenged. Yeah. But, it, but if, if, if this, if it's allowed under the law, there's an option you have. It's up to the board decide what it, you want to do. It's worth exploring. It's, it's sure. your point. Yes. Oh, boy. Um, uh, there's a person wanted to talk. Sure. Um, Mike, you got unmute yourself. You, you want to speak? Mike, can you hear me? You got to unmute. You got to unmute yourself. I don't think I can. I can't. I can't. There you go. Okay, Mike. We uh, can you can you hear us? Yes. Okay. Hi. I'm, this is actually Ann Vicaro. Um, I, my question is what I, I understand what you're saying about the, you know, costs. However, like, what is the explanation for those residents that had over usage for like a three day period that was astronomical? Like, that doesn't fall into what you're saying as to why the costs are like it's the usage that has gone up for particular residents in a way that is not normal um i know that there was several residents that have reported this uh, um i have seen it with me um you do have access to your actual readings uh of what what do you use so you, I understand that. I understand. I'm not saying that. There are certain residents, I believe, that have reported to the village that have had astronomical amounts of water usage being read that they weren't even home for that. Is it oh, yeah. But was that a leak, though? Was it, was it a leak or something? Was it no, it was not a leak. And I believe that there is more well, than... Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt. I was Cindy's here. You can't hear her, but Cindy said it was one person. One person didn't know why. Yeah, and everybody else was leaked. So it was one person didn't know why, but they were away. So they could have been a leak, but they were away for a couple, whatever time it was. Oh, well, there and was two different people that had leaks at the same time. Yeah, they had leaks. Yeah, Cindy said she talked to a couple of people that actually had leaks in their houses and they reported the leak. So because they had the leak, there was a one-time credit you can apply for. But that's only once in a lifetime. Once in a lifetime. And they, and Cindy explained that to them and they wanted to do it, yes. Okay, okay. so I will check with those residents that sure. had different stories on that and mm -hmm. usage being different mm -hmm. during certain okay. times. And that that's my question is, where is that fitting in all this? Yeah, and I, yeah. Yeah, those, indi you know, those individuals, Cindy and Sharon, are always in the office to answer any questions. They can look at the history and, you know, also if they don't know how to access their meter, they can walk and see what's going on. They can do it themselves. 
So whatever they need, absolutely, just call the office. Okay, thank you. No problem, thank Thanks, you. Sarah. Thank you. Anybody else have any questions with the water? Okay. All right. Um, Stephanie, do you have anything? Because I'm going to go around and ask no. the board if they have yes. anything. Marcus, anything else? Um, yeah. just, a, just a quick little thing. Um, Con Edison might be milling and paving Tate Avenue um, before the end of the year. They want to get it done this year. They've been talking to George about that to make sure they meet the requirements to do it. Um, the good news is Con Edison has agreed to put the tap in. That's what they put the tap in. So they want to do a one-time fix, go to the sidewalk and the curb, and they leave our connection in the grass. So that way we can connect to that when we're ready. So that's one update. So if we get an update, we'll put a we'll put it on Facebook, email blast, and everything else that's gonna happen. Um uh, yeah, let people know because that's you know we could do a um, code red too because that's just a busy road. Correct, that's correct. So yeah, so I thought I had something else that I don't remember, but that okay. that's what I remember to make sure everybody knows that might be happening. Are we going to accept that road if they pay for it below forty five degrees? Didn't we have an issue with that? Well, it has that. It, I've talked to George. It has it has a three year warranty on it in case anything happens. Three years, but roads are supposed to be good for twice. Yeah, yeah, but they have a, yeah, but, but they're it, only going to give us three years when they pay when it's. That's why we're they sign up for that. that that they say that's what they do throughout the entire state. Well, so, kind of can do that, but municipalities can't. It's, it's, a, a, it's, a, it's a municipality decision. Mm -hmm. We're not based. I, on I would take it. Mm -hmm. Well, what would you like? So I can go back to them. Can they go in the spring, Sean? You're thinking? Absolutely. The weather warms up. Listen, we, we ran into issues with that on, on Blakely Avenue. We ran into issues with that on other places where it seems in need of. We, we had, and I'm sure George can give you the criteria. Many people can give you the criteria of what you're supposed to put fast in. Mm -hmm. That's why I asked all the clients to close in the, in the winter. I'll get back to count. I'll go back to count us in that board decision. That's fine. Yeah. Well, it's going to be a cold joint no matter what you do. You know, they're only paving from the middle over to the curb line. Right? Curb to curb. Oh, are you yeah. doing curb to curb? Curb to curb. All right. So it's going to be a hot scene. Mm -hmm. Not a 40 degrees, or 30 degrees. <laughs> at 230 degrees coming out of the truck, I think it'll be fine. So what's the boss pleasure? Yes or no? Uh, it's up to you guys. So I can do in the spring. Mm -hmm. They, I, they said they need. They want to give us the option. Or? No, they said they, they need, it's part of their budget process. Done. They needed to get it done this year. I don't know if the contractor's price goes up in January. I don't know. They say it's an, right. to them it's an emergency to get it. They, they say they need to get it done. If they, it's if you tell them no, then financial. they might, they might come back to you. Whatever. Well, I, I do agree with Sean on the three-year warranty issue. Mm -hmm. Not yet. It's not very good. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> but I, I, you know, I know that yeah. they, they only budget. Kind of only has it in their budget for their year, and that's correct. It's part of their budget. That's correct. I don't agree with the the, the timing of it. I, I. Well, if they could do it, if we're going to do it, if they could do it soon, because what's it supposed to be like fifty degrees? That's why they're trying to plan it within the timeline that the weather. Well, they have till December fifteenth. Correct. And, correct, okay. and they can't do it with rain. So they, uh, whatever you guys want to do, I just, they they're getting the contractor ready to go. So they're close. Right. Well, let's see what the temperature is. Well, once you give them the permit, yeah. I think it's, it's yeah, they correct. Go. They just do it. Correct. Yes. So we have our standards. Yes. George has. Yes. No. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right, Sean. Do you have anything? Yeah. It's so we uh, we pay for the Anacon uh, inspection report. Could you uh, give us a report or? Just like an overview of what they found, and what their uh, George, repair yeah. could be, or you know. okay, I get that from George. Yep. And also, uh, I don't have a draft. Of, I didn't see a draft of the ADU. You guys wrote up. Did you send me a draft of the ADU? Yeah. Also, I haven't seen the, our property that we discussed hiring a real estate agent for being up for sale yet. Um, I actually talked to Joe Lapolis last week. Uh, he said he's working on it. Uh, I don't know. I'll ask him when he's going to be listed. I don't. I don't. I don't. <laughs> I'll ask Joe to give me an update. I know I signed all the agreements for him to do it. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I, and I had to sign something online, which I did. So I'll find out from Joe if he has an update. Also, you know, I was wondering what's the uh, status on the parking in back of Monroe Park, where we're allowing the residents to park on village property. 
without any assurance about whether where we are in that status. That's the one with the, um, the lawyer at the, with the, at the circle behind the circle. The Remember the lawyer, the woman? Yes. Yeah. You know, and they built a wall on the neighbor's property yep. and they yep. annexed our property. And you know, it's been going on for a little while. Yes, um, they had they had a lawyer. They're paying for a lawyer. They said they're going to provide a license agreement to give the. I assume they haven't given you anything yet. And right? I've written three times in three weeks, and I keep being told, "Look, we'll, we'll get a hold. I'll get a hold of you." So, the so when's the court date? So obviously, there has to be some violations that have been written for non-compliance for the last year, right? So we should have something scheduled to prohibit them from using our land. We can't just allow certain people to use public land. It's just I, I threatened that as well. I threatened that as well. And they then that same day I sent an email, we'll get you a license agreement, and we haven't received anything yet. So I tell them court leniency do you think we should get? Until somebody gets hurt and we get sued or do it, I'll do it for a thing tomorrow. That's uh are we are we gonna have an executive session? Or? Yes, yes, all right. Yeah, I just have one question, one thing on that. That's all. Thanks. All right, thanks, Steve. Sure. Well, uh, David Smith is here. Could we get just a brief update on the black coverage? Yeah. Yes. So as part of the scope of work, um, we completed a, uh, an initial yeah. review of uh, a survey of the other communities in and around the village of Buchanan on the lot coverage. And then uh, the last piece was um, reaching out to um, the village attorney, reaching out to the building inspector, and then the last person that I spoke to was Mr. Bell. And I spoke to him today just to get some um, uh, feedback on kind of what the um, the ZBA cases have been over the last several years with respect to coverage. So I, I should have a uh, memo, a technical memo uh, to the village by next week uh, for your consideration. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you received my email, right? I did. Oh, good. Okay. Anything That's, else? No. Okay. So Oh, wow. Um, the only thing I had was the I guess the, the one property that I've been asking yeah. about on Bandon Avenue is now uh going to go to New York State auction. So um, uh, Dan is listed about that for a hundred dollars right now. So <laughs> hundred and one in here that uh, there will be an open viewing and November 28th, beginning at 10 a.m. And then you're also allowed to bid up until November 30th, until 10 a.m. So, so but anybody interested? And the, what was the... And it's nysauctions.com. There's a number of properties there, yeah. Yep, there's yep. four all together yep. in the town of Portland that, that are being foreclosed and going to auction. And the one I'm banning is one. So. Yeah. That property is safe for someone to go in. I don't, I don't, uh, yeah, I, I would, no, I not anymore. Yeah. Not does, anymore. Does anybody know what the lien amount is? Because they're not going to let it go for less than what the I would. Lien, I would, I would think if you want to find out more information yeah. to, to, to log on to this uh, website. Um, okay. and, and Mayor, I agree 100. I'm surprised that they need to start with an opening bid just to cover the taxes. I, I I've bid real estate in the past. You know, we start with at least covering the taxes. Well, that's if you're selling the tax money, not if you're selling the property. Oh, I sold the property right. in Pisco a lot, and we always thought at least to cover the taxes, at least to make well, it. What happens if the, if the minimum bid's on that? It just sits there forever. Well, well, we never had the opportunity to happen. But twenty thousand dollars for. Well, twenty thousand, sure. Yeah, even a hundred thousand. Yes, mm -hmm. but you've got you've got years of school taxes, our taxes. Uh, yeah, but normally, P taxes. yeah, but normally Pisco, we we would so we we'll do it about two or three years, not ten. Yeah, wow, this thing has been sitting there. Plus, yeah. like that, you have on that, um, the woman that lived there that owned the property was in a nursing home. So you have that lien on top of that. Yep. So it's got to be, got to be pretty substantial. Everyone would have to agree to not take their full amount. Well, I think that's going to happen. Yeah. Yes. That's why I was just wondering what the minimum minimum is 100 no yes, yeah that, i don't yeah, see that going for that that's all i have yeah. okay thanks Dan. Yeah, thanks for updating because i know people always ask about the house on down avenue yeah because it's been an nice eyesore for years yeah. it's a shame it was a beautiful house it was it beautiful was. house trustee capricotti what do you have for us this evening i just have a few things that for executive session okay. um nothing really you guys touched on everything here uh i just wish the village residents a happy thanksgiving mm -hmm. likewise 
Happy Thanksgiving. Everybody. I just want to make a few announcements. The, our annual tree lighting ceremony is at 6 p.m. Um, on Sunday, December 4th. There'll be raffles, hot chocolate. It's always a good community event. Um, it's the village's turn to do Pearl, the Pearl Harbor Day ceremony this year. It will be on Wednesday, December 7th at noon on the second floor. So please feel welcome to come and to the ceremony. Um, I've had a question there. I, I didn't realize that there were people using the Lens Cove dock. Um, the cement area, and I know we've discussed it, but um, there's people who use it for the kayak, there's people that use it for rowboats to go out to fish and, and whatever, but um, they were asking if um, they could just, if somebody could just put like the cement in to cover the the rebar. And I know we've had this discussion, but they they still they still use it quite a bit. Yeah, so yeah, put the rebar. Yeah. Talk, mm -hmm. talk to George about that um, based on that concern. Um, uh, George said in order to get it somewhat repaired is at least thirty to $40,000. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and you still have to go to the Army Corps. Of, you have to go to Army Corps Engineers. You can't touch that dock without going to Army Corps Engineers. Yeah, it's not an easy process, so, yeah. if I remember. And ju just to remove the concrete. Was, Correct. Uh, I'm looking at it. I have it in my notes. It's 17000 17, Yep, that's it. Yeah. So... So what their question was, where it's exposed to just put cement in, but even just put that cement in, it would be, you'd have to still get approval. Yep, and Army Corps of Engineering might say you might have to redo the entire thing. I don't know, you, you have, oh. then you got to hire George to, to talk to the Army Corps. Yeah, we got it, we, we did, we got an estimate, and it was well over $30,000, mm -hmm. you know. I think they were just looking at a simple fix of filling it. Got to go to Army Corps. Oh, okay. all right. Is that, sure. on, is that below water? Is that below the... the... At times, the tide, uh, yeah. Below, yeah. Mm -hmm. When the tide comes in, yeah, definitely. Need to no, I was going to say the north side of the ramp, it's a slope, there's a beach. You can walk right, yeah, there. you don't even have right. to walk on it. And, and, you can walk right. on the gravel and go to the inlet, and, and you walk straight down. That's right. And on low tide, you can walk even past <laughs> that's the right. ramp. Mm -hmm. Now, are we going to move forward with removal of that? Uh, yes, I think the, uh, well, the you know, I think we decided not to do anything the last, because you have a discussion with another company. So the idea was to hold off until you finish your discussions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Correct. Mm -hmm. One of the other questions I wanted to ask, we have an annual audit. So are they finished with? They're finished with the field work. The field now work. they got to find it. Uh, um, as soon as they finish with the a draft report, I get it over to the board. At least they gave me that, like I said, the water. Water information. So they gave me the water information knowing the meeting was going to take place. I want to make sure I have the most up-to-date information, okay. but they haven't finished their order yet. They're still working with Cindy with, because even though they finished the field work, now they go back and Cindy keeps on responding to more questions back and forth. So it's not complete yet. And I know Cindy's been very busy uh, <laughs> working on our, but we do an audit every year. So yeah. and it's, it's a lot. We have to. It's a lot of work, yes. Mm -hmm. so, but thank you. Um, the other thing is our recreation supervisor, Nancy Bayer, would uh, like to buy maybe about three or four signs advertising the hours of the ice skating rink. She called me today. Um, so just to let the board know she's interested in doing that, um, she'd like to put it in a few different places around the village. Um, I'd like to change you know, let me know. Uh, I'd like to change our workshop for December is scheduled on 27th. I'd like to change it, uh, move it to December 20th. That's okay with the board. Is that again? So from the 27th, yeah. uh, that's January, the 27th to the week before, which is the 20th. I'm okay with I'm okay everybody with else. That. Yeah. And I don't know, it's going to be an interesting year next year, kitties. Um, Sean mentioned the ADU uh, legislation that uh, Senator Harkham has proposed. So I'm sure that's going to rear its ugly head again um, in January. Uh, Teresa, I'm sorry to cut you off, but Peter found some good information on that. Peter, maybe you want to, oh, you went to a meeting. It's a good oh, great. You brought it up. Thank you, Peter. Yes, yeah, so get, well, get your mic closer. Well, that's the last meeting I uh, last year. We have a representative of the state for us for this talk, our position, and he 
uncovered and buried bill that they turned down the original, you know, says it's on the video, and now it's hidden again, and they're just waiting to go back. I don't know, it's there. getting past. And they're trying to push it through, so we're trying to all get together to try to save the life safety issue. And so what bill was it embedded in? Uh, but it did not have the on it. So he said he found it. And he brought it up in New York City, so he has a copy of it. So, Peter, maybe you can ask, reach out to him tomorrow or something and ask him if he has any information so we can get it to the board as well. That would be great. So I do have it back on the table because he hid it and he found it. Uh, so, they're trying to push it through. Yes, yeah. Um, other things that are happening, I don't know if anyone else has seen this. I, I read this today. Um, so, the wheel of the wheel of radar garbage plant that's in peak skill. Their permit is due to be renewed. So um, Senator Harkin has called for a public hearing on the renewal. And uh, one of his quotes is, it's an environmental justice community. Um, I do know the same people that were anti-nuclear are working on getting that, the Willabrator plant closed down. So I don't know what we're going to do with the garbage, but um, that's that's what's going on right now. So there will be hearings. So when you hear it, that's what they're working on, trying to get that closed down. Sponsored by Harkham again? Yeah, Harkham is asking for a public hearing on that. So yes, yes, mm -hmm. yes. So all kinds of fun things to look forward to in the new year. Um, other than that, I think I have, you know, we're going to be going into executive session. Any comments from the audience? No comments, questions, any hands raised? Nope. Okay. I want to wish everyone a happy Thanksgiving and we look forward to seeing you at the tree lighting. So I'd like to make a motion to go into executive session to discuss contractual and also personnel. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank you.